Okay, welcome um, for this afternoon on uh, inequality, on inequality in Africa. Um, it's quite... Uh, Africa and inequality are topics which are not usually uh, related to each other. And uh, we uh, found uh, or we, we invited Anne-Sophie Robillard to, to give her view um, on uh, this topic or, or on how she joined the two, the two topics. The, the title will be What's New About Income Inequality in uh, Africa? It uh, reflects work by uh, Will, World Inequality Lab in, uh, at the Paris School of Economics. Um, and Sophie Robillard is working uh, as, uh, at IRD, uh, Institut de Recherche pour le Développement but also coordinating um, for Africa at World Inequality Lab. Her work mostly fo focuses on issues related to poverty, population dynamics, inequality, and gender in sub-Saharan African countries. Uh, and Sophie, I will give you the floor uh, immediately for a presentation of like uh, 20, 25 to 30 minutes. And afterwards, we can have a discussion with the participants. But um, we also agree that if uh, while uh, or during the presentation, there are all already uh, questions of clarification. Uh, please uh, do not hesitate to put them in the chat, and um, perhaps I will then uh, interrupt you and um, and ask some sub questions during the presentation. Okay, so let's go. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Tom, for the presentation, and, and thank you uh, also for the invitation. Thank you for the for letting me giving me the opportunity to present uh, this work. Uh, so, as Tom said, I am uh, a research fellow at IRD, and I am also uh, the um, Africa coordinator uh, for the Will uh, Inequality Lab, which means that I am in charge of uh, putting together, updating the data on uh, on income inequality. And this, the work that I'm going to present reflects uh, recent work uh, related to that update. And it's also uh, very much related to a paper that came out in 2019 that uh, we are currently um, working on. Uh, but the paper in 2019 was, was by uh, Chancel, Konyu, uh, Gita, and, and Kovic, and I, and, and, I'm, and I will cite them uh, quite often in the, in the, in the reminder of, of this presentation. Um, so the presentation, uh, I mean, the, this work tries to answer uh, four questions, broad questions, uh, and these are more working progress or uh, these are related to a program of research. Uh, so the first question is, what do we know about inequality in Africa? Uh, and, and I will mention some, uh, some dimensions of, of the current, of the recent research about inequality in Africa. Uh, quite rapidly. Uh, then I will uh, delve into the data to, to, to try and, and see how big uh, uh, African income inequalities are, how it varies across the continent, and whether it has uh, changed over time over the last three decades using the data that, uh, that, uh, that we put together for the World Inequality Database. But first, I want to show you this picture, which uh, some of you may know. Uh, it's the uh, picture that came out uh, as the, uh, uh, to illustrate the cover story by the Time magazine in 2019. It's a picture of two suburbs in, uh, in Johannesburg, South Africa. And the, the cover story, the title of the course cover story was the world's most unequal country in the world and, uh, and was um, uh, was uh, devoted, I mean, was to, devoted to describing uh, the issue of, uh, of inequality in South Africa. So I, I find it quite striking. I find it's quite interesting to see this, uh, this type of, of illustration of inequality. I will come back to, to, to South Africa uh, when, I, when I discuss the results of our, our, of our analysis, but I wanted to show you this picture uh, just for, for starters. Um, so, as I said, I will discuss a little bit the literature, I present the data and methodology uh, got together at the, at the World Inequality Lab, and then present some results of this uh, recent uh, updates, uh, as well as, as, um, as uh, about the evolution of inequality from 1990 to 2019. So, 
Research on economic inequality in Africa is relatively recent, and this is related to the fact that most research in Africa focused on poverty. That was also consistent, obviously, with the um, MDG uh, agenda. Now, the agenda has moved to SDGs, and as you are well aware, uh, SDG 10 focuses on uh, reducing inequality between and within, country, between and within countries. Uh, so that also uh, goes together with a, with a more focus on this issue of inequality across the world and in, in Africa in particular. Instead, I just wanted to, to point out that tradition, uh, there is a long tradition of research on inequality in Latin America, uh, which was deemed for, has been deemed for, to, to be the most unequal continent in the world, uh, uh, because there was in, uh, in Latin America more data to support evidence of very strong social stratification, because the political context was, was also very different from that in, in, South, in, in Africa in general. Uh, with a, a more um, a stronger political polarization, strong political social and social movements, and strong intellectual support uh, for the left, and also more um, uh, better documented history of colonization, of slavery, of latifundia, etc. Uh, in 2007, a, a colleague of mine at, at, at IRD and at PSU also, uh, Denis Cognot, uh, published a book on inequality in Africa and, with, and showed that actually inequality in Africa is quite high, at least as high as, as that in Latin America, and also contrasted uh, countries of Francophone and, and Anglophone Africa, uh, showing that uh, inequality is higher in, in Francophone, in some countries of the Francophone Africa under study. In, in this case, it was a couple of, of, of countries in Africa, not, not a not, uh, not all countries of, of, of the continent, but showing in that in, this, in, his, in, in his sample of countries, there were um, determinants of, of uh, I mean, the, the inequality was related to urbanization and education, uh, and in particular, um, higher levels of inequality were found where there were lower, averages, lo lower average levels of education, uh, with a high skill, a high skill together that goes together with a high skill premium, and also a smaller number of um, of better paid civil servants. So that was also one of the results of of this work to to show that in countries where there was there was a policy, there was a, a choice to to hire smaller numbers of civil servants and pay them better was was a characteristic of Francophone Africa. Uh, in, uh, with, in contrast, sorry, to, to Anglophone Africa. There's, a, there's been more, obviously more research on, on Africa, uh, stressing historical drivers such as colonization, and there is work under, uh, there is work in progress on, on, on that, uh, st stressing also institutional drivers, and here I mean post independence institutional drivers, and I will talk a bit, a bit about that. Uh, when I present the results. Also research uh, pointing to structural drivers, uh, the, the so-called lag structural transformation or the, the, the specific trans structural transformation that, that, Africa, that some countries in Africa have experienced moving from an agricultural economies to a service economies without, without the industrial state, uh, stage. And that poses a number of, uh, raises a number of questions. Also around the issue of inequality, um, some, some work on, on, I mean, that, that uh, emphasize issues of, of setting up uh, redistributive policies in weak states, uh, weak states which have a limited uh, social and fiscal policy, um, low power to, to, to implement regulation, and uh, as a result of, of, uh, of a limited fiscal, fiscal space, uh, low public spending and, 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 uh, and low um, public services. So going back to what, uh, what the WILL project is and what the DINA and what the real research focuses on and, and what the DINA uh, project is about. So DINA stands for Distributional National Accounts. And the idea is to try and distribute all the components of national income inequality. So that's one first uh, dimension and focus uh, and focus of the project. 
A second focus, as you might well be aware of, is getting top incomes right. Uh, and, and for that, uh, use uh, in particular fiscal data. Uh, and a third aspect is going back in time, which I won't, I mean, which is not what we, we, I, I'm, I'm doing here and, and not something that, um, that I'm going to talk much about, but that's also, uh, of course, uh, a strong component of, of real research uh, to, to, to go back to, uh, to the 19th century and, and, and work with archives. In the case of uh, many developing countries, the issue related to the issue there is related to those objectives, in particular the objective of, of getting top incomes right and, and getting at the distribution of national income, uh, is that we have little and poor data on income, uh, even more so in long run obviously. And the re one of the main reasons for that, uh, the, the reason why it is very difficult to get good data on income is that. Uh, both agricultural and non-agricultural informal sectors are very large, and these uh, sectors have um, a lot of, in particular, the agri agricultural sector has non-monetary um, flows, uh, un, uh, such as own consumption, um, related to own consumption. Also, these incomes are... Um, Collect, I mean, at best collected at the household level, not at the individual level. It's not an issue just of collection, it's just that they, are, they can hardly be measured at the individual level because they, they imply a family work. Uh, these incomes are seasonal and irregular. Uh, and also going back to the issue of um, functional distribution of, of, of being able to, to, to track over time or across countries, uh, the, the factor shares, uh, I mean, working on on, uh, on mixed income raises a number of issues uh, that I know Bronco mentioned already uh, and was discussed uh, at the last seminar. So in our case, in order to have, uh, 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 to be able to measure inequality in, in Africa, meaning at the country level in, in most African countries, is to use consumption. Uh, because that's where we have more data. Uh, it is deemed in those countries to be more reliable than, um, than, um, than income. There are issues, however, uh, related to the, the fact that uh, because of the ambition of, 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 the, of the project, um, we need comparable, we would like comparable data over time and space and and that's an issue because uh, when you start working on household survey data uh, in many uh, developing countries, in particular in Africa, but not only, uh, you realize that there are very important variations in sampling and questionnaire design, both from one country to another, but also within a given country over time. I've worked in Senegal for many years and, and I've used many, many uh, household survey, I mean many, there are not that many, but. I've used a number of household survey data uh, in, in Senegal, and, and there, are, there are a couple of them over the last two decades, and, but it's very depressing, depressing to realize that, uh, that, uh, that the way consumption is collected differs from, from one survey to the next, even within a given country. So anyway, we have to use that, and the solution to, to, to achieve the objective of, um, of computing of measuring uh, in, uh, inequality of incomes, uh, of measuring the distribution of, 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 uh, of income is to somehow upgrade uh, consumption data. And the best source, or at least the, the, the more comprehensive source of consumption data we have is the Pofcal Net database. Uh, and so the, the one of the, uh, one of the, um, the tasks that we, we do as regional coordinators, in particular in Africa, because that's where we have uh, less uh, access to, uh, to micro, micro, um, micro data, is to use the PovCalNet um, uh, survey tabulations. So the PovCalNet uh, project you, you might be aware of has been building those uh, consumption uh, aggregates across time and countries for decades. It started uh, in, in the early 1990s. Uh, thanks to uh, work done in particular by, by Havali and, and, and others, uh, putting together uh, 
all the data available uh, on using household surveys, putting it together on, 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 the, on the website in order to monitor poverty at the global level. So the, the objective from, of the PovCardNet is, is the same, is to build a global database. And so we, we, we decided to, I mean, it was made, the decision was taken to ground the uh, weed estimates on this important effort of uh, harmonization. So as of September, 2020, the Pofkanlay provided survey tabulations for 50 countries in the Africa region for a, a total of 234 observations, because some countries have more than, uh, than, than just uh, one point. So what we're using, what the main input we're using in this uh, work uh, for the, for the, the, the weed uh, database is the consumption sh shares by centile, uh, which are what is provided by, by PovCalNet. Uh, sometimes it's only their size, but that's really for, for very old uh, surveys, for, very, for surveys for which the sample is very small. But in general, um, uh, PovCalNet provides uh, consumption shares by, by same time. It is updated twice a year, and we try to follow that update to also update uh, the width. So just to give you a sense of, uh, of the countries uh, and of the distribution of countries across a continent in terms of size, I've just uh, put them together in terms of, um, of GDP shares. Uh, so uh, if you take the three biggest uh, countries, South Africa, Nigeria, and Egypt, uh, each account for around 15% of, of total GDP. So altogether, they represent 45% percent of, of African GDP. Next come six uh, big ones, big countries, Algeria, Angola, Ethiopia, Kenya, Lib uh, Li Kenya Libya, and Morocco. Uh, and next, uh, another eight. I'm, I'm going to stop at 10, uh, not go further down, but uh, as you see, the, the, the 10 medium ones are already quite small because altogether they represent uh, a, almost 8% of GDP, which means that uh, that each one of them represents is, is less than 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 what percent than one percent of of African GDP. So just um, let me give you a sense of the types of adjustments we make to to the inputs that I described, which is the uh, the distribution of co of consumption across centiles. So uh, the first uh, so there are three adjustments. The first one is is allows us to move from uh, the distribution of survey consumption to the distribution of disposable income. This is done by just by uh, first estimating um, consumption income ratio profiles using uh, available surveys. So for, for a couple of countries, we do have both income and consumption. So for, so for those countries or those data points, uh, we can uh, estimate uh, uh, um, can fit uh, a function, it's a logic actually, uh, to, to, to represent how uh, the ratio of consumption to, to income uh, behaves along the distribution. And so we then uh, apply uh, that uh, profile to all the countries in the database for which we don't have, uh, we don't, don't have information on, on, uh, on income. So this, this is a rather simple or straightforward way of, of doing things. We're trying to improve. Uh, we are thinking about improving this, uh, this estimation by using data on both survey characteristics and country level characteristics to, to try and come up with better, uh, better adjustments. The next uh, adjustment is, uh, allows us to move from disposable income to pre-tax household income. So this is required, I mean, this is uh, needed for two uh, reasons. First, the fact that top earners are underrepresented in household surveys, which is well known, uh, and also to the fact that incomes that are collected in surveys usually correspond to disposable income uh, rather than pre-tax income. So there again, we have to make use of information for, for countries for which we have information on survey for both survey and fiscal tabulations. So this is the case in, in, um, in Africa for Côte d'Ivoire and South Africa, and, and hopefully soon for Senegal as well. Um, and we, then we use a method uh, developed by Blanchet, Flores, and, and Morgan to, uh, to combine this information and adjust, uh, and adjust the top incomes. And we interpret, I mean, we, this, this uh, adjustment 
is uh, corresponds to to a move from disposable income to pre-tax uh, household income. Obviously, access to country-specific fiscal data, which is also under under way for in some countries, will uh, will allow improving uh, this adjustment. The last uh, adjustment relates to um, uh, the uh, the last stage is is to move from pre-tax household income to pre-tax national income, as I mentioned before, the objective is to distribute national, national income. Uh, and that requires estimates of unearned income components. Unfortunately, uh, this data is, uh, is missing in Africa. So as, as of now, the gap between surveys and national income is just distributed proportionally to individual income, simply by rescaling all incomes to match the national income average. So this is not very satisfactory. We know that uh, this is likely to underestimate real inequality, real income inequality, uh, given that uh, retained earnings should, should be attributed to capital owners and capital owners belong to the top of the income distribution. So again, uh, these adjustments are, I mean, more realistic allocation methods are, are, are on the way. It's not just for Africa, it's for, for, um, for uh, the whole, uh, at least non-OECD, let's say, country many non-OECD countries, for which we have issues of, of access to, to, to unreported income data. Um, another um, another um, adjustment we'd make, or it, it's not really an adjustment, then we, once we have all these, uh, uh, once we have the, 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 the pre-tax national income distribution uh, constructed using adjusting the POFCAL uh, data, then we make a number of, of interpolation and, and extrapolation. Obviously, all of you know that uh, surveys are costly. In the case of the POFCAL database, the average number of surveys by country is slightly less than five years, and we want to cover uh, we want to cover the period 1990 to 2019. So we need to to come up with to, with simple and, and transparent rules of of um, of um, interpolation and extrapolation. So the interpolation is quite standard. It's just a linear interpolation between survey data points and, and beyond the last survey data point, inequality is supposed to remain unchanged until uh, 2009. And for a few countries, we actually don't have any available survey tabulation, uh, either because those countries did not collect any household survey data or because the data is not accessible. And this is the case for, uh, for five countries. Eritrea, Equatorial Guinea, Libya, Somalia, and Western Sahara. And for those, we use uh, default rules that were adopted collectively by, by the WID to distribute um, national income using the average distribution in neighboring countries. So obviously, the, the neighboring countries uh, vary from, from one country to another. So first results, um, I'm trying to move this because it's not very convenient, sorry. Uh, the first, so this is the just the the, the results from the last update. Uh, top ten income shares across African countries in 2019 using the the, the, the uh, based on the methodology I, I, I just presented. So you can see there's a, a wide range. Uh, it, it varies from uh, slightly more than 35. It's actually 37 for Algeria to uh, 65 for um, South Africa. So that's the top. 10% income share across uh, African countries. And the average for all African countries is, uh, is 50. Now, if we uh, plot these, uh, if, we, if we put these numbers on a map, we get the following uh, map of, for Africa. And, uh, and the colors here indicates uh, the, the uh, a range of, of inequality. So you can see that the sorry the the darker um, darker colors refer to to higher levels of inequality uh, and what is interesting in this map is that it um, shows that uh, uh, some kind of it shows that there is a gradient between uh, south and north with lower levels of inequality uh, in the north and uh, higher levels of inequality in the South, in South Africa is here. The, the gray countries are the countries for which 
uh, there's no data. I mean, in the in the WID database, as I said, uh, we, we do the, an imputation in order to be able to cover all countries, but not in this uh, in this map. Uh, so uh, Western Sahara and Libya and Somalia and Eritrea are not, are not covered. Yet. No, neither uh, Guinea Equatorial. Yeah. So um, our interpretation of, of this gradient uh, is related to uh, two important aspects. I mean, historical aspects, uh, because I mean, we are looking at recent inequality, but it reflects uh, obviously the history of, of these countries. So the high levels uh, of inequality are found in countries that experience uh, so-called white, white settlers colonization. Uh, type of colonization that produced both very high land concentration through uh, discriminatory laws of access to land and uh, as well as low uh, rural uh, wages through uh, mobility restrictions. And at the southern tip of the continent, unsurprisingly, South Africa, uh, who experienced that colonization and then also experienced um, apartheid, exhibits the highest level of income inequality in the world. Uh, so white settlers colonization and institutional spin-offs also uh, shaped high levels of inequality in other countries of the Southern Africa region. And, and we see that outside of South Africa, top 10 shares vary between 49% for Lesotho, 64% sorry for Namibia, a country that remained under South African rule until 1990. Uh, this confirms that uh, conditions at the time of independence have a long lasting impact, and it illustrates also one important uh, effect of colonization, in particular when uh, discriminatory institutions are not only set, but also maintained. And this, this is um, consistent with the uh, Adring and, and Robinson analysis in, in 2012. Uh, and I also want to quote uh, Ericsson and Walras' uh, paper from 2004, who indicates that uh, inequality of resources lead to the development of institutions that are geared toward protecting the interests of, of the elites. Their paper is on land inequality, but I, I, I liked, uh, I liked uh, the way uh, they, they presented things. At the other end of the continent, uh, countries of Northern Africa exhibit relatively lower levels of, of in income inequality. Top 10 income shares are estimated at 43.9 on average and, and range from uh, 37 in Algeria to 49 in South Sudan. In Egypt, which is one of the biggest African states, as I, I showed before, the top 10 share is estimated at 43.4, high level by OECD standards, but uh, much, much lower than Tala. So, this, is, this might seem puzzling since uh, those countries also experienced a settlers type of uh, European colonization. Uh, and, and most, uh, but most, I mean, there are two, two um, things that could explain why the levels of inequality are, are, are lower compared to, to Southern African countries. Uh, most gain independence earlier than, than, than many Sub-Saharan countries. Uh, for instance, Egypt gained independence in uh, in 2000 in uh, sorry in 1922. Uh, but more importantly, following independence, many northern African countries embraced some form of uh, Arab socialism. Uh, there was Nasser in Egypt, Gogiba in Tunisia, Bendela and Dimudiem in Algeria. And that could explain why uh, I mean why the, the that would be consistent with low levels of inequality as, as, as we can uh, infer that, that those institutions maintain the uh, lower levels of, um, of uh, I mean, higher levels of redistribution and higher levels of, 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 through higher level of taxation and public spending and also maintain institutions that were less, uh, uh, less favorable to, to, uh, to inequality increase. The last, uh, the sorry, the one. This is just one last uh, result focusing on Africa with at the subregion level, where we can see again this gradient. Uh, it does not show very strong. I mean, it does show contrasted trends. Let's say across uh, across the different regions, which are uh, which we still need to to to, to dig into and try to interpret. Uh, there is some decrease in, in inequality in Southern Africa. Uh, there is some increase in Middle Africa and uh, 
and, and some decrease in Western Africa, we still have to, to dig into that more to, to try and interpret that. And that's, that's work in progress as well. The last two um, graphs, figures I wanted to show you are related to um, Africa versus the, the rest of the world. I mean, present Africa with uh, respect to the rest of the world. And uh, I took those, uh, those, those two images uh, from the paper I, I cited uh, earlier, the Chancel et al. 2019 paper. Uh, so, they, so this first graph shows uh, how, where Africa stands with respect to high inequality countries such as Brazil and India. So Africa on average, so sorry, this is the aggregate uh, share. This is not the, the average country level share. This is on average, on, uh, at the continent uh, level, uh, the share that goes to top 10 households of, uh, of the continent. And obviously uh, this is very much driven by, by South Africa, which is both a very rich country by regional standards and has very high levels of inequality. So the aggregate share is, is above 50, it's 50, 53, I think, um, slightly under uh, Brazil, India, and the Middle East, but above USA, Russia, China, and much, much higher than, uh, than Europe. Uh, one striking uh, result also from, from the, this, uh, the analysis is that uh, there is a very high ratio of top 10 to bottom 50 uh, incomes, average incomes. And that's something also that we need to, to dig into to try and understand what, uh, why is Africa different from other regions of the world, from other countries. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a quite a striking result. So some takeaways, income inequality levels in the African region are high with average uh, country level top 10 uh, income, top 10 income shares estimated at 50. To, to give you also a sense of the adjustment made, uh, if, we, if we compute the top 10 uh, consumption shares, uh, we, have, we are 16 points below uh, uh, the estimated uh, top income shares, which is expected, but I, I just want to give you a sense of, of the, the size of the adjustment one, uh, one uh, does when moving from consumption to, to income. And obviously, I mean, there are, many um, assumptions that are made along the way and, and many improvements can be made, but, but we believe that, uh, that, that it is important to focus on income and be aware of the fact that uh, inequality of income is significantly higher than, than, than inequality of consumption. So the next result, which I already um, uh, discussed is the, the, the North-South gradient which is likely to reflect, as I said, the situation of independence and the political economy and institutions that followed. Uh, again, and this is also, can be also illustrated by the fact that income shares vary from 37 in Algeria to 65 in South Africa, which is a huge, a huge uh, gap. Um, also inequality uh, level seems to have changed little and, we do see contrasted dynamics, but we, we need to, to, to dig into that to try and understand uh, why, uh, what explains those, uh, those dynamics. So the road ahead, we have two objectives uh, to improve our estimates for the, the, for the, the WID database, uh, and that we, will um, be possible by um, collecting, obviously, better data on household incomes, Better surveys in particular, but there's not much we can do on, on, on improving the quality of surveys. This is uh, pretty much out of our control. We can do advocacy for that, but uh, obviously better surveys are needed uh, for purposes or also of, um, of I mean, because the, the, when, when, design, when um, uh, I mean, the, the objective of having a global view and, 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 and a comprehensive view uh, has to, to rest on, 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 on comparable data. And that, that, I think, is really an issue in the case of household surveys, in particular in Africa. So design harmonization, uh, harmonization of design uh, is needed. Uh, obviously, it would be better to work with income, but, but I, I, and, and income should be collected when, 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 whenever possible to also improve, uh, improve the estimates. 
Um, access to fiscal microdata will allow, also allow us to, to improve uh, our, our estimates. I think it would be interesting also to, to develop a line of research on, on proxies for income inequality. So I don't know if, uh, if it is something that is part of your research agenda, but I would be happy to hear your, your thoughts on that. Uh, so there is really more, much more on current uh, inequality or, I mean, recent inequality, not, not necessarily current, to try and figure out how we can use uh, big data on flows, for instance, remittances flows, uh, data on, on trade, uh, which, at, at data for, which is data for which we have long series. How can we possibly try and interpret uh, that data in connection with, uh, with inequality uh, to, to to improve or to um, yeah to support to support the findings uh, we have uh, using household surveys, and obviously the second objective is to improve the analysis to ground the institutional inter interpretation more firmly. And, and as I mentioned, Konyu's uh, work uh, at PSU, who has um, worked on that in the context of, of different projects. Now the current project, project is called Colecopol, uh, uh, which focuses on, on the history of colonization in, uh, in Africa, in, in, uh, uh, in Francophone uh, uh, countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and also the second line, which is more related to work I, I, I'm doing uh, now at, at Will, it is to investigate the determinants of, of the contrasted trends that I mentioned at the regional level, uh, as I, I mean, likely suspects are obviously the dynamics of the skill premium, the dynamics of commodity prices, the evolution also of direct taxation and transfers, and this is very much work in progress. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, um, Anne Sophie. Um, let's uh, jump immediately to some uh, some questions. Um, um, Marcus Leroy was the first, in fact, to to ask a question, but I think it, it was on the, the historical origins of inequality. But I think, Marcus, that your question has been answered in the meantime. If not, please come in. Thank you. Um, not exactly. Um, I see that um, well, the, the inequality is, is to a large extent, the, the current inequality is to a large extent uh, attributed to post-colonial uh, situations, and I, I think that is rightly so. Uh, my question is, is rather, well, I see that in pre-colonial times, inequality in Africa was, was, was huge. There is enough uh, uh, literature on that. Uh, is there, do we have any idea to what extent the current inequality is a continuation of these, uh, this uh, pre-colonial inequality? Of course, in that respect, South Africa is a bit of an outlier. Uh, it, it, it hasn't been a, a colony like other uh, African countries. It has been a, a settler uh, colony, uh, but uh, for, for a, a large part of, of uh, the rest of Africa, I think the question is, is justified. Uh, do we have an idea if there is any continuation of pre-colonial inequality? Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Yeah, I think um, obviously South Africa, but more generally the Southern African region where was a white settlers colonization that was prolonged after, uh, after independence. Uh, one, one country that I didn't mention, but I mentioned in the brief is uh, Zimbabwe, who inherited from a very highly unequal uh, land distribution. Uh, some progress might have been achieved, although this is contested uh, through, the, through the, the land reforms that took place uh, in, the, in the 2000s. Um, but as I said, it's, so there is a, there is a prolongation of, of institutions of, uh, of resource distribution, uh, this resource, this unequal resource distribution uh, may or may not be reversed by the political institutions that are set up in, in, at independence. So my, my point was to say that uh, the, the contrast between uh, the Northern and the Southern African regions would 
experienced uh, colonization and white settlers colonization is institutions that were set up after independence. Uh, so in, in Southern African countries, those institutions maintained an unequal distribution of resource. And this was not uh, so much the case in, uh, in Northern African countries. Now, another, another uh, dimension of, um, of the legacy of, of colonization, as I said, is uh, when you contrast uh, Francophone and, and, and Afri um, Anglophone countries, and, and you see that uh, different choices were made in terms of investment in education, uh, and also um, the structure of, of uh, public wages, uh, how, at, at what level uh, uh, civil servants' wages are, are, are set, uh, and that is likely also to shape uh, the distribution of wages and, and, and influence uh, current levels of, um, of, uh, of inequality. Okay. Uh, Usman Amadou, could you um, unmute yourself and ask your two questions, please? Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Robia, of um, your brief. Thank you for your brief presentation on income, income inequality in Africa. I have two questions. Um, the first question is about innovation and entrepreneurship in Africa, for example, because you mentioned. Um, colonialism and uh, the institutions as one of, uh, let's say, some of the causes of um, income inequality in Africa. What about the entrepreneur? What about um, those who innovate and they, they do business, they make a lot of money from their business? Um, can, can this be considered um, one of the, can this be considered as uh, a cause of income inequality in a, on the continent? Let's say that's the first question. My second question is about, um, your uh, method of measurement. You talked about both calnets. Uh, I wanted to know if they use the same measurements as the Gini index because uh, they also do the same thing. Thank you. Um, yeah, so about innovation, I, it's not really a, uh, my, my um, line of research, but uh, I, I, it's very much related, I, I believe, to at least uh, two or three aspects that matter for, in, for income inequality, which is the distribution of education. Uh, and, uh, and so, as I said, uh, there are contrasted levels of uh, income inequality across Africa, and they are likely also to be related to the distribution of, of, of education. So the choices that were made uh, in, uh, in, in how uh, um, the choices in terms of investments uh, in education uh, shape uh, the distribution of wage and shape the distribution of, of income. Uh, regarding, um, and, and just a, a, maybe just a comment on the issue of entrepreneurship, obviously it's, it's key for, for African countries to, to have entrepreneurs and, and develop uh, talents uh, related to, and business skills. Now, the, the, the issue that comes next is the redistribution, the possibilities that the states have to redistribute uh, income uh, and what we see from other work that I've been doing in, in, in Africa, in Côte d'Ivoire, Senegal, and, and Mali, is that when you look at, uh, at the top 10, um, of the, of the, at the top 10 households, only a very uh, small fraction of them actually pay direct taxes. And so that's, that's also an issue that, that African states have to deal with, is how to, to tax uh, high incomes uh, better. Uh, related to your question related to about POFCAL, I'm not sure. I mean, we you can you can we can also use indicators. Uh, we actually at the wheel we like uh, top shares better because I think they are uh, we believe they are more powerful also in terms of of, of policy and 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 it's easier also for citizens I think to grasp the issue of inequality using top shares than using Gini coefficients. I don't know if you remember seeing pictures of the Occupy Wall Street movement where you had people marching with the, we are the 99%, meaning we are the 99 bottom uh, of the population as opposed to the, 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 the top 1%. And I found that's quite, quite interesting. But of course we can produce genies as well. It's not really an issue. So uh, what is the main difference between uh, your measurement and the Gini index? That's what I'm asking, actually. 
Well, the gene is a synthetic index, so it, it measures um, uh, the distribution along the whole distribution. I mean, it's a, it's a synthetic indicator that takes into account distribution uh, at the bottom, in the middle, at the top. The top, so we could produce bottom shares and top shares. The bottom only looks at what share goes to the top. That's, that's the only difference. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, then there's a question by uh, Sarah Carpentier on um, the estimates whether they are influenced by different quality of population data in Africa. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I was wondering, your data are based on household surveys, and so I guess you use some weights to make extrapolations to the whole population, but having worked on civil registration systems, I was wondering how your estimates are also affected by um, the bad quality sometimes of population data, because you, you have um, focus on mm -hmm. the low quality of the estimates of consumption, et cetera, but the population might be also um, an important factor. Yes, well, uh, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, the, our estimates are as good as the data is. <laughs> uh, so obviously, there are issues with the income measurement on which I focus, but there are, there are other types of issues. Uh, census data is not collected um, frequently enough. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, I agree, but that's, that's not, there's not much we can do about it. Um, uh, we haven't tried it at this stage actually to, to, to improve yeah. the population. I just sometimes uh, used also for political reasons, etc. And so, yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely it's, it's, it's quite sensitive <laughs> countries. Yeah. Okay, I give the word then to Melanie Sierans. Melanie. Thank you very much. Uh, I would just focus on my, uh, my last uh, question. Uh, to what extent do you have more details on the links between resource rich or resource natural resource poor countries and inequality? Uh, is it possible, for instance, that like specifically for South Africa could be a, a very specific combination of settler's economy and uh, natural resources? Or is this something you did not really specifically uh, research on in this study? Thank you. Well, um, yeah, I, 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 it is true that I, I could have uh, cited uh, resources as one uh, dimension um, or, yeah, one dimension that, that matters uh, for inequality. I, 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 I cited other, other things because, uh, the resource rich, resource poor was not, I mean, does not provide um, an explanation for that gradient. It does, it does provide some explanation for country level uh, specificities. But uh, I haven't not at this stage investigated that much more in the paper by, by Chancel. There is a, there is a, a type of, um, uh, of typology of countries using, using different uh, characteristics and, and what that's one characteristic that they look into. It's, uh, it's, it's obviously one, one aspect. Okay, there's a question by Sam Hintz as well, an historical question. Sam? Yeah, it was more a question of uh, clarification to uh, compare your results, which are now really focused on the north-south comparison, to look at the earlier observation in the literature between Francophone uh, Africa, um, um, see if, the, if there are any um, comparisons to be made with your data and the earlier observations. And this also links up to the earlier question of colonization, because now at the moment I felt that in the presentation, it, quite, it was quite a deterministic view on colonization, that it had a, a rather generic impact on inequality. So maybe you can connect a different kind of history of colonization also to your data. Yeah, sure. Thank you for, I mean, that's something I try to do in the presentation, but obviously, uh, I mean, my line of research is not is not from a historical perspective. So I try to to to, 
to grab uh, interpretations from uh, from uh, my colleagues who, who work on that. Uh, as I said, I I, I, th I, I I emphasize that link because it's a, it's a plausible interpretation of the data we have. But as I said, also there is there are two things. It's not only the the, the, the legacy of colonization, but what was set up after independence. Uh, and and from that perspective, I think uh, that northern African countries uh, tell uh, tell uh, tell a specific story. Um, but again. Uh, my my uh, um, personal uh, feeling is that the uh, high high the very high levels of inequality in the southern African regions are very much related to at least initially the the distribution of land and uh, uh, and that drives the distribution of wealth and that drives the distribution of of income. So this is why. I focused on that, uh, also mentioning the fact that some countries might have achieved some reduction of that through, through land reform, but these are extremely difficult uh, to, to do, to carry out, uh, extremely difficult and, and, very, and, and very costly also from a number of, of, uh, of perspectives. Okay, uh, Jean-Pierre Kilosho. Could you ask your question? I think Jean-Fier is um, logging in from uh, Bukavu. Yes, thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Rubila and Tom and others. I think my question is almost uh, related to the questions that have been already asked. I think the problem with this um, study uh, to me if you want to to improve it we could think a bit uh, more on uh, the political economy i feel like um, the distinction of country based on uh, geographic uh, aspects does not uh, tell too much maybe you could look at other aspects that are uh, almost uh, uh, based on uh, some uh, specific aspects, uh, say informal aspects, uh, conflict aspects, natural resources aspects. This can help to improve uh, the analysis, I think. Well, yeah, thank you for the, for the suggestion. There is an ongoing work also at the wheel by colleagues of mine, including uh, Thomas Piketty and, and Amory Guetta, on political cleavage. And so they are looking also at how, um, at how polarized uh, societies are and how that polarization might have evolved over time. Uh, as I said, I mean, the, the, the research on, on those issues are, is, uh, is, is more recent not than, 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 um, than in, in Latin America where this issue of, of political polar, polarization was much, uh, was much uh, more prominent and, and research. Uh, Africa, uh, on, uh, in Africa, there is a lot of, there is more research on political capture, which is, which is related to, to also what you're saying. But the connection between co political capture and colonization is also what were the, what were the, what was the distribution of factors inherited? And, and how was that or not reversed at the time of independence? So I think it is related. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, uh, and Sophie. So we, uh, we, I think we're almost at the end of the seminar, but I would like to give the floor to Agnieszka uh, Kazimierczuk uh, concerning a very uh, recent uh, topic. Agnieszka, could you log in, unmute? Yes, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you, Anna Sophie, for this presentation. Um, I'm working for the Include Knowledge platform in the Netherlands. We, we provide a bridge between academia and policy making in the Netherlands in the area of inclusive development. Um, and what, uh, what is, of course, very interesting for us um, are the recent, very recent developments and how COVID actually affected um, not only, well, it affected the entire world, but um, in particular, how did it affect the inequalities in Africa? 
Um, so I was very curious whether uh, you um, did manage to perhaps collect some data already on that, um, on the continent. And if yes, would it be possible for you to share some preliminary thoughts? Uh, and if not, I would like you maybe to try to speculate. And what are your expectations based on your experience and data? Thank you. Well, unfortunately, um, we don't have recent data. Uh, we did not collect uh, recent data. I have not been uh, involved in, at least in this type of research. As I said, the WEED uh, uses uh, PovCalNet uh, data. So as soon as we have post-COVID data, we will be using it and, and hopefully interpreting it. From a more uh, very uh, I mean, grounds level uh, view, uh, my interpretation uh, of the events in Senegal, which you might be aware of, there's been a number of demonstrations uh, related to political questions, but also related to the fact that there is a large, uh, very large um, uh, urban, uh, unskilled, uh, young population that has suffered a lot from, uh, from lockdown. Uh, which I mean, and that obviously is is is, is an issue. How that uh, how that play whether that plays a role in in global in I mean inequality at the country level is is different. There we're just looking at groups, uh, and 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 it's more related, let's say, to horizontal than vertical inequality. Uh, and some specific groups have been hurt uh, quite quite a lot. And whether these groups have uh, the capacity or the power to disrupt uh, the political systems that are in place in Senegal. It's, Senegal has been a democracy since independence, but uh, those demonstrations were quite um, quite striking. Uh, although they are not the first, I mean there were also demonstrations in 2011. So, I mean these are populations that are uh, vulnerable, and they have they have been um, even more hurt uh, by COVID. I think. But these, I would say that probably COVID hurt more the urban poor than, than, than the rural uh, populations. But that's, that's just an intuition, not, not grounded on, on, on data as far as of now. OK, thank you very much, uh, Anne-Sophie. Again, thank you very much, Agnieszka, for your uh, question. Uh, but I, I fear we have to, to end the, the seminar here. Uh, we promised to have a one hour seminar, and, uh, and we already passed uh, 2 uh, p.m. I guess other participants will also have other occupations. But um, okay. we'll, uh, yeah. we'll have the opportunity to take uh, an, another look at uh, the chat the questions in the chat perhaps and um, and 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 uh, give an answer to each of them i believe uh, and sophie just to to come back a bit to the discussion we just had that the, uh, your data set is in your data set it is possible to differentiate between different groups huh? for example also between um, cities and the countryside uh, so you could uh, do that uh, more detailed analysis, I think, with your data set. Huh? Um, so it might also be possible, I guess, to do a follow up research and then compare before and after the, the pandemic uh, eventually. No, we hope to have access to such type of data. As it is, it's not possible because the, the, the tabulations we're using, is, it's really just tabulation, it provides us with the share that each centile gets of total consumption. But I hope. So at some point we can we can manage to get access to more detailed data allowing yeah. to do this type of analysis because i believe that uh, that also looking at horizontal inequalities is very important okay thank you very much thank you very thank much you very to much. The, the speaker to the participants and uh, i also invite you in fact to the next uh, april seminar with uh, walter scheidel which will take place on the 23rd of april huh, on inequality technology and uh, and power and i'm sure it will be a, a much more uh, historical perspective um than uh, compared to uh, today even if, if today it was already quite historical as well Thank you very, Thank much. You very much and have a Thank nice afternoon. All. Nice afternoon.